So we are now on episode three of the Human Element podcast. Um, once again, I am Blair Solberger, registered dietitian. Um, we have Nick here, Nick Shikitano, or Nick Schick. Is Nick Schick a, is always yeah, easier. RD to B. Um, this episode, we are going into supplements. So this is going to be more of an overview of supplements. So we're going to look more at, um, you know, which, which ones are the, the ones to go for, which ones are a waste of money. We're not going to dive too much into research on specific supplements because that becomes a giant rabbit hole. Um, if we see interest or decide that we are interested in a specific supplement, um, I can tell you right now, BCAA and creatine, if we don't cover those enough, then those might be two that I'm interested in. Um, and then we are going to uh, talk about what supplements that I used with NFL players and kind of the, you know, how they, how they behave there. And I guess more specifically, we're going to look at supplements for the average gym goer versus supplements for performance uh, and, and what makes a difference there. And then we'll wrap it up with a trend uh, or fad, what's going on there. And then uh, that'll be it. So we'll try to keep this one a little short. Last, last episode got over an hour and a half. We just rambled. So no promises, but we'll try to keep it shorter. Like Blair said last time, um, about an hour, give or take, usually give us a little more. We tend to go over. Yeah. So the, the, the title of this episode is Don't Trust Your Supplement Guy, which yes. I love because. Do not trust oh your God. supplement guy that used to be me that was me last as recently as last may and the whole reason why i quit was because i i hated it i felt like a terrible person just because of the shit i had to do to make money because you're lying to people yeah because <laughs> absolutely like i mean lying through my teeth as much as you can to get the goal was to get like about $150 out of somebody. You don't want to go for 200, but you definitely want it to be more than 100. Anyway, yeah. but before we get into it, we wanted to introduce kind of like a new, new segment, new mini topic, which is like kind of, it's a, what are we working on? And like, how's that going with some sort of goal that we have? So I know earlier, our first episode, we talked about both of us have weight loss goals. I don't know, Blair, did you have anything other than the weight loss goal? Um, so I actually, I am trying, yes, to lean out, but I, I try not to use weight loss as my ultimate goal. I just look for improved health in general. Um, you know, so I track more than just the trend of my weight. I think I mentioned it previously where I track um, my average number of calories, the days that I had consumed alcohol the days that I didn't track at all. Um, and then I actually track like my sleep score um, average for the week and things like that, just so I know, okay, was my sleep better or worse this week, that kind of stuff. So I think health is should always be the goal. And sometimes health includes losing weight or losing fat. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm still on a lean out. I have lost about seven pounds this year. Um, Sweet. Yeah. So but my weight fluctuates so much, man. Like mm -hmm. I went from 222 after about a month, I was down to 215 and then I was back up to 219 and then 216. I mean, so like I don't weights. That's why I think weights kind of wonky is just because I, mine fluctuates real bad. You know, it's not, it's almost never super straightforward, consistent as far as like I have been eating 2,500 calories a week or a day and, and it's chunking down in this manner. Uh, 2,500 is actually under for me. I'm 27 is my goal, but I don't always hit it. As long as I hit my protein, I'm happy. Yeah. And it also kind of depends on your scale. I mean, if you're using a home scale, if you're using a gym scale. So for instance, the scale that I use most of the time, it's usually about two to four pounds less than what the gym scale will be. And um, actually, I recently had to go around the house and measure my weight in three different spots on the house because the floor is not level either so like yeah oh see i weigh the same scale the same time of day the same day mm -hmm. of the week and in the same spot of the house every yep. time so yeah. um i don't know if it's your internet or my internet but you're kind of lagging at random intervals hmm. yeah i can test my internet real quick i don't know are you still plugged in yeah okay well then it's probably mine Let's see what speed test is telling me. 
Yeah, my upload speed is 440 megs per second. So I think I'm okay. Or my download, I'm, I'm hitting like 400 megs per second. So how do we even check? Speedtest.net. Yeah, 369.4 was my average, and my upload is 22. All right, connecting. Eighteen ping. Ninety-five to it's actually still going up for download. Yeah, I mean that should be. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't is, know how any of this works. My ping is five. So I, uh, yeah. one thirty-four. Oh my yeah, download. that should be more than enough. I don't know. Maybe it's it might just be a random yeah. Zoom thing. It, yeah. And either way, it'll be fine on Audacity. So yeah, yeah. So um, that's that's the most important thing. I think most of our listeners are audio, not on YouTube. Yeah. Um, anyway, but, so yeah. So you were saying like uh, pursuing health and all that. Any performance goals or anything like that? No. Uh, all right. So performance. I am switching to. Actually, I, I was going to crunch just because it, it was cheap. It was 25 bucks a month and I was allowed to take guests. But the issue I had was there, I don't like their protocols. It's kind of, I mean, Florida's just full open. So I could only go at like five, six o'clock in the morning or 2 p.m. You know, those are the only real windows where I felt like it wasn't so busy that I was kind of anxious. Um, and, and so like originally the idea was I can go whenever I want. And that's more in like open, but when I was with the rock gym, which is more expensive, but they have weights in the back. It's not the best weight setup, but most people go to climb. And I, I, what I'm going to try to do is either use a mixture of outside working out or, and their weights to supplement the climbing and then do like, I'll bike there, jump rope. Uh, so I'm going to switch to going back to the rock gym. Uh, I just think it's, uh, it's more fun and it's, you know, that I think it's, you can track weights obviously, but rock climbing gyms have a built-in tracking where you're going up in their scale of hardness from like a V zero to, you know, V five or whatever it is. However that, you know, yeah. um, you know, I, I like bouldering better, which is where you're not harnessed in. It's the more like problem solving, um, you know, so that'll, that'll change things up, but no, not really, gotcha. you know, no well, performance. What about you? Um, actually, part of the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because of that like step competition that you've got between mm. you and Tony. And I promise I'm going to get there. I went to get my Fitbit and everything today, and I had it on the charger. I don't know where it is now, but so <laughs> mm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not ducking you on this step competition. I will get destroyed with pride, but. I can't find the Fitbit, but anyway, the reason why I still need six thousand steps today. So, so I don't know. Did I tell you that my goal with the Fitbit is to progressively increase my step count? So, okay. I had a Garmin back in the day that did that on Mac. They didn't have all the features that a Fitbit does, like the heart rate. I had to buy a separate heart rate band, and it wasn't. It was literally just like steps, time, calories burned, that kind of stuff. Um, but. Uh, Hang on, I'm plugging my Fitbit in actually. The thing I liked a lot about that Garmin, the Vivo Fit, was that if I beat my step goal, it automatically calculated a new step goal the next day. Sweet. So I made a, a deal this year. Every time I started at 10,000, every time I did that step goal for seven days straight, I increased it by 500 per day. And I'm up to 12,000. And I've, nice. I've, I've missed by one day the past two weeks where something happened, Super Bowl or whatever it was, where I didn't hit my 12,000 steps. And it was actually the last or second to last day of the, of the week. <laughs> so it was like I changed it on Monday oh. and it was like Sunday and I, I failed. Yep. Um, so now like I'm very determined today and tomorrow to hit my 12,000. Because yesterday I hit like 20,000 steps. Yep. Uh, I was just real busy. But yeah, so I got to go on a nice long walk after this. Nice. Um, yeah, I know yeah, I don't so. get anywhere near the recommended that ten thousand. I know I don't hit that. Well, actually, anyway. ten thousand is made up. It, I, I saw some Let's research showing that, like, so the step goal for improved cardiovascular health was like seven thousand. Huh. 
and they just decided on 10,000 because I think 10,000 for the average stride length is about five miles. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of made up like 10,000 is easier to remember than 7,000 kind of thing. So they just said, okay, everybody's trying to get 10,000, which is not bad advice, but like you don't see any improvements from seven to 10,000. Um, hmm. that like, you know, so 7,000 was the cutoff for like, you actually get an improvement in physical health. I think the thing to realize and understand about it too, is why it's important to get one that has like an accurate heart rate measure. Cause I actually have a post on my Instagram, if anybody's interested on how the calorie count on these watches is way off up to 90%, like really not good. Apple watch included. Like there it's not when people post their calories, it's, it's bogus. Um, but the heart rate's pretty, is pretty accurate. And yeah, that within 5%, Sweet. Wow. you know, so it, yeah, it was, it was good. But so the idea to me is it's not just about steps because you can get 10,000 steps going on one long walk and then, you know, doing chores around your house. And yes, that is movement, but trying to get your heart rate up on that walk. You know, if your heart rate never bre breaks hundred beats per minute while you're on your walk, it's, yeah, it's movement, but it's not really applying any like pressure or change you know so like trying to walk fast enough to actually get into like a little bit higher of a heart rate is more the goal than just simply getting the steps in my opinion i mean by all means if you're getting under ten thousand steps a day try to get ten thousand but then try to start actually getting you know some activity out of it not just movement yeah like start where you're at and then increase increase your cardio yeah push something um, intensity or distance which that loops back around into my my personal goal which it's a performance goal and because i had that same thought i was like you know what? i could go for a walk get ten thousand steps but if my heart rate's not increasing i personally don't feel like i'm doing that much like it's still better than nothing but it's probably not like the whole goal of moderate intensity exercise it feels like light intensity exercise but anyway so i was thinking about this step competition and i was like oh you know i've for a while wanted to get into like distance running Gross. just because yeah <laughs> i mean it's something i've never been good at uh when i was playing ice hockey ice hockey's real stop and go so it's more of like a sort of like a sprinting sport but um I've always wanted to, you know, be able to run multiple miles at a time and be perfectly fine. And then when I came into with this, this idea of competing on steps with Blair, I was like, you know what, how could I, how could I blow this out of the water? Cause that sounds like fun. It's like, okay, he bikes like 40 miles at a time. I was like, let's take in like the next five years, become an ultra marathoner, which that's a lofty goal. We need to create smaller goals than that, way smaller. Um, so my personal goal is by the end of the year to have run a marathon and start with a 5K. So. Um, yeah, I think so. It's funny too, and this we can be another topic, but most people don't train running properly, especially sure. people that do it for performance. I think there's a, there's a huge difference between like, completion goals just wanting to run a marathon mm -hmm. and performance goals yeah yeah so for me, where this is if you want to get goal. better at running most people what they do wrong is they find their comfortable pace eight miles an hour whatever it is and they just keep running at that pace longer and longer and longer and that doesn't ever actually make you a better runner you have to so the running threshold so basically there's two main components which is your vo2 max and your lactate threshold. Typically the people that win a lot of marathons or place high in marathon, uh, you know, finish early have a pretty high VO2 max, but very rarely is it in order of VO2 max as so VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that can be exchanged in your lungs. Um, it, 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 and so the, the lactate threshold is the percent of VO2 max that you can maintain exercise without stopping. So basically, if you go above your lactate threshold, your body will, you can't clear the lactic acid, which is what causes you to become sore, and you have to stop to let that clear out. So your lactate, right at your lactate threshold is when your body is able to clear it as consistently as it creates it, and you can maintain what's called steady state. 
um, the highest lactate threshold percentage of VO2 max tends to run the farthest, the fastest, because you can maintain, if my VO2, we'll just make up numbers, but if my VO2 max is 20 and yours is 18, but you can hit 90% of your VO2 max's lactate threshold and I can only hit 80%, you know, you will probably do a little bit better because you can maintain a higher percentage of your VO2 max for the entire race. Yeah. Um, that number, lactate threshold, is drug up through like very high intensity cardio. It's not pushed up from the bottom hmm. by running longer and longer and longer. You know, so that's why, yes, if you just want to like finish a marathon, just keep running. But if you want to be good at running, it's a totally different story and yeah. it requires like an educated strength coach and exercise testing. Sweet. It's kind of like, um, so like I said, the first goal is run a 5k. So run a 5k. And then as you're slowly increasing your miles, also be making sure that you're decreasing your single mile time. Am I following correct? Yes. So yeah, you will never really run a faster 5k by running longer than a 5k you know like if you just keep running a 5k you know and then run six miles and then run 10 miles you're not really going to be faster at running a 5k it's just going to be more comfortable yeah kind of like you're not for anybody who's not used to running but is used to like lifting it's like you're not going to be able to lift more if you're curling a five pound dumbbell 50 times like you're right. not going to yeah. be able to get up to that your muscle might get dumbbell. bigger but you're not yeah yeah um so yeah uh, but like I said, we can, that can be a whole, a whole nother yeah, topic, another be, whole topic. I'd be yeah. mad at you for saying a whole nother because <laughs> another isn't a word, but I'm Southern. I'm going to say what I want. Yeah. And I mean, so uh, when I was listening back to our last episode, the number of times that I said, you know, I, I couldn't handle it anymore, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but this gets us into our main topic, which like we said, do not trust your supplement guy. Take it from me. The whole job is to create problems that you did not realize you had to sell you something that you did not realize you needed. For instance, most well, not even didn't realize you needed that you, you don't, don't need. need. You don't need. Yeah, yeah. It's it need needed or with quotations. I have that here in our notes, but I didn't. Yeah. I didn't indicate it yeah. in the audio. It's like when you listen to comedy and they do a gesture, and you're like, I uh, can't. See like, that. Yeah, yeah but yeah so you don't need them yeah. um well and, and i think that's too because i even on like clubhouse the other day i some guy was asking about lifting and, and gaining and something like that and obviously the first question is going to be about progressive overload so that's making sure like we mentioned to get stronger you have to keep increasing the amount of resistance you know whether that's total volume which is the reps times the weight um, and then, or if that's intensity or speed, like you have to increase some amount of resistance in order to see the muscle continue to grow. And then you have to feed it, which would be giving it the right nutrients, typically protein. Um, the amount of times I hear people mention carbohydrates with weightlifting, like carbohydrates are an endurance nutrient. Like, don't get me wrong. Certain exercise protocols like CrossFit will use your quick glycogen stores so that like within one minute, like hundred meter kind of, um, you know, or thousand meter run kind of stuff. But if the exercise lasts less than 20 seconds, you're not using carbohydrates. You're using creatine, which we'll get into as one of the supplements and, and then you're resting, you know, so it's it, carbohydrates are not super necessary. They're more of an endurance thing. Um, you know, so lifting is more of a training and then recovery kind of thing. Whereas, there's a lot more of a pre exercise nutrition component to like endurance and performance. Um, but I, um, they, we're talking for the casual gym goer. Like, you know, I think it, it, the whole, the story is completely different when you start talking about super elite level performance. Um, and then, um, so I was like, you know, and then I would say creatine supplementation, which we'll talk about what creatine is and how it works in just a second. But the, some guy chimed in. He was like, "Yeah, I, I hear all that, but like, my first question would be like, are you are you supplementing glutamine?" And I'm like, "Oh no, you sound like such a GNC bro coming in. <laughs> like, so glutamine is an amino acid, 
it's not even an essential amino acid. Your no, body can make your it. Your muscles make it. Like. And it's in every complete protein. It's in most non-complete proteins. So if you take a whey supplement, you don't need glutamine. If you eat enough protein, you don't need glutamine. So it, glutamine can be conditionally essential, which means times of like surgery, high stress, things like that, it can be necessary or beneficial to supplement it. But we're talking about like burn victims or rhabdomyolysis and things like that. Not, are you taking a protein supplement? Like it, it was sold for so long from like GNC and supplement stores as optimizing your protein absorption. And if you look at the container, glutamine is in the amino acid profile and typically in a very high amount. And it's just funny to me that like you try to tell me, a registered dietitian with NFL experience, that my advice was okay, but are you taking glutamine? And I just laughed. I laughed. I like turned, I unmuted myself and laughed because it was that like, I'm going to laugh in your face for saying glutamine to me right now. I do want to take a pause to celebrate the fact that Blair dropped the NFL credential by himself. <laughs> like I've been, I've been saying, I'm like, you need to, that's your, that's your thing. Like, let them know. Anyway. Um, this is actually a shirt from the dolphins. The Cobra, I know it's a Cobra Kai shirt, yeah. but the Gase, the first coach was very nerdy. We had like a Assassin's Creed shirts and he just made random shirts that he wanted. And we, there, there they were. Yeah. Yep. So, and I mean, if you're only listening to the audio, Go check out the YouTube version too. We yeah, appreciate it. Oh, um, see my holy trinity of supplements on the yes. whiteboard behind me. Blair, Blair has a uh, he double majored. He got an art major. So yeah, I <laughs> am not an artist whatsoever. Please don't expect art when you go to YouTube. <laughs> You'll be very disappointed. Um, so yeah, and I think that's a good lead into like our main thing here is going to be, you know, is it worth it? Is it bogus? Is it potentially dangerous? Um, and I so I forgot about glutamine as an option. I mean, yeah, I sold that. It was kind of like an intermediate, but yeah, we sold it for recovery. And the whole time, like I'm pitching it to someone, I'm like, this is bullshit. Yeah, it's like, a, this it's is a what $40 they want supplement for it that doesn't do shit for you. Yeah. Like, and so I think it's, so in the Holy Trinity behind me, which sorry if that's sacrilegious, but I have whey caffeine and creatine as as the holy trinity of supplements and the reason for that is not just because they work but because they are the three most researched supplements on the planet um and so i think it'd be good to to define what a supplement is to start with because i actually kind of put whey on the fence um so to me a supplement is a non nutrition addition to diet in order to cover some sort of deficiency or in, 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 include a benefit that couldn't be achieved through normal nutrition. Um, the reason I, I, I think it's kind of, there are certain ones on the fence is like our vitamin supplements. Yeah. You know, but like vitamin D is one of those ones. It's almost impossible to get through normal nutrition. It's even almost impossible to get the right amount of vitamin D through like sunlight bathing. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but the hormone that causes your skin to tan or darken, melanin, blocks the conversion of sunlight into vitamin D via cholesterol. So the more tan you get, the darker you are, the less vitamin D you make from sunlight. You know, so like I would always joke with my players when I would give my presentation and be like, Hey, uh, how many of you guys are black? And I mean, most of them raise their hand and it's like, <laughs> well, I hate to break it to you, but you probably need to take a vitamin D supplement. Cause you're, I'm, I'm much better at producing vitamin D than you are. Uh, so we get skin cancer and vitamin D and you guys get, <laughs> you guys have to take a pill. So, um, but yeah, I mean, and it was just a way to break the ice, but it's, you know, a lot of people don't think about that. You know, people say, oh, sunlight, you know, and the recommendations for vitamin D are so low, 400 IU. I take 5,000, which would be more than 10 times the RDA. And mine are like just in range. You know, I'm like in the dead center of the, of the range for what vitamin D should be. So it's just one of those things that like almost everybody's deficient and almost every cell uses it. So yes, it's a supplement because 
I can't get it normally through diet, but it's also something that's completely normal in diet. And it's not something I'm adding on top. You know, I, I don't know. It's, you know, that's why I think it's kind of like, I think when I think of supplements, I think of things like BCAAs and creatine where you're like extracting just a component and, you know, creating a pure form of it. And, you know, and vitamin D is just like, okay, it's a vitamin um, and I'm just taking it in a pill form. So. I do want to take a second and this is exactly why we're going to go more than an hour on this episode too, is imagine being in the room, you're on an NFL team, you're, you're a black dude. And the dietitian goes, how many of you are black? You're like, this man don't have eyes or something like, (laughs) I don't know that that kind of got me. But anyway, getting back to the main topic, um, protein is probably the most talked about supplement out there. So that's kind of what we what what we wanted to start with. And Protein. First off, do you need to take a protein supplement? No. Kind of, de- kind of depends on your goals, but mostly no. Like if if your goal is to have like three hundred grams of protein a day, which, which is, but yeah, that's 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 a wild amount of protein. Like you might need one just to hit it, but really you don't need to take it. That being said. I would still put that in the worth it pile just because like if you're not hitting your protein goals, no matter what they are, it can't hurt. I mean, unless See, you get, I think the only time that protein supplements are a hundred percent necessary is with veganism. Okay. Um, vegan, there is not a single vegan source of high protein that is not higher in either carbohydrate or fat. Uh, nuts are much higher than fat than protein. Quinoa is much higher in carb than protein. And I, I hate when people say like, oh, oh, quinoa for protein. It's like quinoa is like 30 to 35 grams of carbs per serving and eight grams of protein. So it's like three times, four times as much carbs to protein. I wouldn't call that a protein supplement or a protein high, a high protein, you know, meal. Um, lentils is probably the best bang for your buck, but even still it's higher in carb. So unless you're very diligent as a vegan who lifts to get the right amount of protein and structure your diet properly, I think that's where you really get the benefit of having a vegan plant-based protein. And even if you look at plant-based protein powders, they are 160 calories a scoop because the amount of fat and carbohydrate attached to it versus you can get whey that's, I mean, you can get 25 grams of protein in a 110 calorie scoop. Cause it's that much, just like almost pure protein. And I don't think they taste great. You know, if you don't have a little bit of carb and, and fat in there, it's like drinking chalk in my opinion. But, you know, I think I consider whey for an omnivorous diet, a convenience more than a supplement. It's something that you can absolutely achieve through normal diet with whole foods and the whole like, 30 minute window, like that's garbage. You have two hours for optimal protein absorption following a workout. You know, so it's not like you have to like take a protein shake to the dome as soon as you finish lifting in order to make sure you get gains. You have two hours, just go eat a meal. Um, But I think what it boils down to is it's a lot easier to carry around a little blender bottle with a scoop of protein in it and add some water while you're on campus all day or you're at work and you just have a container of protein that doesn't require a fridge sitting at your desk. You know, I think that's why it's more of a convenience than a supplement. Like, yes, you are adding, you're supplementing protein into your diet by having this powderized form of it, but it's like a chicken breast in a powder form as opposed to, you know, requiring a lot more maintenance and work to have available. Yeah. So protein, do you need it? Nope. Is it convenient? Yes. Does it work? Does it work? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, way is king. Uh, and I, I don't fight me if you want to talk about plant-based <laughs> proteins because the research does not support it. Casein is not as, I mean, they, they each have their differences. If you have milk sensitivities, if you are adamant about being vegan, go plant-based. If you don't have a reason to use a vegan protein source it is less absorbable it is higher calorie it is more expensive and it doesn't taste as good so i've i've had 
200 different vegan protein powders that have been sent to me uh, while I was in the two years I worked for the dolphins, I had so many samples sent to me and not a single one didn't have a grainy texture. I'd say one of the better ones I've had was like Vega sport, uh, body logics is pretty, I mean, there's some good ones, but I've had whey protein that literally tastes like a cinnamon roll. And I've never had a vegan protein powder that mixed to the degree of just like smoothness that you get out of a, a case or a whey shake. So, um, whey is king. Absolutely. Whey, whey is the absolute best. Then you have like protein mixes and then, you know, plant-based is fine. I just, it's not better. It has certain uses and, and like the ones I just highlighted, but it is not better in any way. As a matter of fact, a lot of research has shown that it actually has higher amounts of heavy metals in it because despite the stupid argument that, oh, animals get their protein from plants to skip the middleman, also not how the world works. Um, it's not how we, our physiology works. Yeah, we are not physiologically the same animals. We're not ruminants like cows. We don't have the enzymes to break down most of the plants that are out there. You know, the, the, as far as number of plants and number of plants that are edible to us on an enzymatic level, it's very low. You know, like we can't break down cellulose, which is what most plants are made out of. So you aren't skipping the middleman they are actually in in the terms of the middleman filtering out some of those heavy metals and toxins so that instead of it being derived directly from the plant which grabbed those metals from the soil it's being filtered out by the cow's liver and then that milk is being turned into uh extracted um you know supplement for you an interesting thing so whey protein comes from a it's a byproduct of the cheese making process so most cheese is casein based so when you take cow's milk it's about 80 percent casein 20 percent whey and the casein when they're separated is turned into cheese because it's a much creamier and it, a lot of times the fat stays with that side of it and then there's an enzymatic process and it becomes cheese and it's aged. And then that whey, it can be used to make ricotta. There are certain cheeses that do come from whey, but by and large, a lot of that whey is then broken down um, and turned into a powder and then flavored and made into whey protein. Um, there's a really cool product out there called Native Isolate. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's a French company that is. So another interesting fact about supplements, a lot of times they all come from the same laboratories. You know, 80% of the proteins you buy are all coming from like Douglas Labs or something like that. It's, and they're buying it, mixing it, and flavoring it as whatever brand nutrition. But it's, it's likely the same product, you know. Um, so... Uh, this native isolate is directly made from milk instead of the cheese process, which does require heating. And it has like higher levels naturally of leucine and arginine, certain amino acids. And it's, you know, it's a really, if you don't like that cheese making process, for whatever reason, there's a more natural native isolate is what it's called. That's a more direct, it's not a byproduct, the milk is being used directly to create protein instead of it being like, we're making cheese. And then what do we do with this other part? But so what about like mass builders and meal replacements? What are your thoughts on that? Um, so meal replacements, it depends. I've seen a few that like are actually derived from whole foods and have like a lot of vitamins and minerals and stuff. In my opinion, it's just like smoothies. I hate when people try to promote smoothies as a weight loss thing. I use smoothies exclusively as a weight gain tool in the dolphins because I'm not ever going to be full off of a smoothie. It, it may be immediately, but less than an hour later, it's like I never ate, you know? So, and I can pack six, 700 calories into a smoothie and make that thing taste amazing, you know? So like, <laughs> it's not, I, it won't replace a meal for me. If you just need, you know, you don't like eating. I don't, I don't encourage fa training fasted. So if you just need something before you get out the door, I think meal replacements are nice instead of a hundred and so calories, it's like 200 and something calories and you get, you know, a decent amount of carb and a little bit of fat on top of it before you go hit the gym at five o'clock in the morning. I think that's a great use for it, but I don't think it's a meal replacement. I think it's, you know, 
I'm never going to feel drink a 250 calorie shake meal replacement shake and be like, yes, one meal consumed. I mean, like if that's how you are great, but I just, it, it won't do that for me. Um, and then mass builders, all it is is whey protein with maltodextrin added to it. I mean, they, they might have their own f- formularies and blah, 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 but it just has a like non-sweet, non-nutritive carbohydrate added to just pack on calories. So it, if really you just focused. hate eating, like when that, that's the thing is if you have issues gaining weight, first thing is looking at your training. Um, so the, the Weight gain and weight loss are almost opposite, in my opinion, as far as how they behave. Uh, Weight loss is a caloric balance equation. If you burn more calories than you consume, you will burn fat. If you need to gain weight, you typically want, so you want to lose fat, you want to gain muscle. Just eating more does nothing. The body has to be told, signaled to build muscle, exercise, resistance training, and then you feed it. Muscles are, are signaled or broken in the gym, fed in the kitchen, and built in the bed. So you first have to signify to the body that muscle needs to be built and then feed it. So if you're not training and you're trying to gain weight, training will, one, make you hungrier, and two, will signal to the body what type of weight to gain. Um, you know, but I think that if, if you just hate eating or if it's really hard for you to eat the number of calories necessary to gain, look at your training first. But – yeah, they can be helpful, but I would recommend just making your own by buying frozen fruits and making a smoothie, throwing a couple scoops of peanut butter in there to get, you know, the extra calories and that kind of stuff. Find calorically dense foods that you like to eat and add them to everything as opposed to buying and spending too much money on a mass gainer. And you can make it taste way, way better than that mass gainer smoothie is going to taste. Yeah. But I mean, honey, any kind of sugar, you can add peanut butter, avocado, seeds, nuts, all kinds of fats. Um, Because once you have signaled to the body to build muscle and then consume the right amount of protein, it's just calories. You know, like that's the thing is it's, it's about just, it doesn't matter whether they come from maltodextrin or, you know, uh, peanut butter. You're just trying to put calories on to make sure you're getting enough nutrients and not losing fat mass. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So, BCAAs. I would say these are probably one of the more controversial supplements out there because a lot of people die by them. I mean, I, I think they're absolutely, I would consider them bogus because if you're getting your protein requirements, you're getting enough branch chain amino acids. Your thoughts? Um, I agree that I think they're bogus. I think they're a waste of money. I So, BCAAs have some research that I think is beneficial as so they were designed for and then immediately improperly utilized. And there's a little story behind that. But so the, the reason that BCAAs were created was as an intra workout. So the, the BCAAs are leucine, isoleucine and valine. The leucine is the most researched stimulator of that muscle building pathway, which is referred to as mTOR. So your mTOR pathway is what tells the muscle to build. I've learned from prominent researchers that it's not necessary that leucine is the most potent activator, but the most easily radio labeled and studied. So it's not necessary that leucine's the, be- leucine's the best at it. It's just the easiest to track. I don't know. I haven't seen the research myself, so I'm not going to say that's truth. But either way, if you do believe that leucine, or if it comes to be that leucine is the most potent activator of mTOR to signal the muscle building pathway, still, the idea behind leucine originally and the branch amino acids was that leucine and the branch chains can be taken into the muscle very easily and quickly during workouts. So like a lot of times, most of your digestion and uptake pathways other than nutrient, like nutrients, especially carbohydrate, is shunted and, and downregulated because the body is focused on the active muscle movement. Well, the idea and the, the science has shown that the leucine can come in and help minimize that muscle breakdown during exercise. So basically, there's research showing that it can delay fatigue and soreness during a workout, intra-workout. 
because of that mTOR simulation aspect, what bodybuilders did was grabbed BCAAs and said, well, this is almost zero calories and I still am getting the leucine to make sure it's stimulating the activation of that mTOR pathway. What most recent research I've seen, and I have the study on my computer if you're interested, showed that it was a meta-analysis and it showed that across the board, there was either very weak research that it helped in any way, or there was strong research showing that it actually caused a net negative change in muscle protein because you are only getting three of the nine essential amino acids required to build muscle. So mTOR was activated, but you had to break down skeletal muscle to get the other six essential amino acids to then supply the muscle to build new muscle. Mm. So without the presence of all nine essential amino acids, you were losing muscle mass, even though mTOR is being activated. You know, so it's not just the activation of mTOR is not the only thing that matters to build muscle. You also have to have the proper nutrients available to build new muscle. You know, so I think that's kind of what's happened is BCAAs had a good intent and there is science to support that fatigue and, and muscle breakdown portion. But then it kind of turned into, it's like a cheap calorie, low calorie version of whey protein. And I can just use that instead of zero calorie protein, bro. Yeah. Zero calorie protein. <laughs> um, I'm a fan of EAAs, which is, it's mm -hmm. the same concept as BCAs, but it's all of your essential amino acids. Yeah. Um, but then again, so amino acids have calories. Um, I think it's three calories per gram instead of four, like, uh, it's, or maybe it's 3.4 even, you know, but they do have calories. The reason it's not often listed on the label is because just like protein, they have such more important functions that they're not likely to be utilized as energy. So like in order for protein to really be used as energy, it has to be converted into ketone bodies or um, carbohydrate. And those kind of things, gluconeogenesis, blah, 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 are on demand. You know, if you don't have enough of the other nutrients, fat and carbs to perform this process, it will break down an amino acid and turn it into energy to make sure the process occurs. But it's not what it really wants to do. Um, and, and we can go into research on that uh, in another episode as far as like it, whether or not protein wants to be used as energy or, or stores energy. But yeah. And that's pro probably don't like I'm not saying anything definite here why you see a lot of people they're usually lifters who try out the carnivore diet and then give it a handful of months they're a lot leaner than they used to be is because that process of turning proteins into carbs and fat is so hard it's it's so hard to do plus proteins used for everything or almost everything in the body that um Fuck, I even missed where I was going with that. I got distracted by my chair making a noise and lost wow, it. Wow, man. <laughs> um, well, and, well, in carnivore, like, it's by definition keto. Mm -hmm. You can't, I mean, so um, carbohydrates don't really exist in the animal world. We, so we store carbohydrates as glycogen. Interesting enough, I learned this in undergrad. I was, I was actually like interested in this idea. And then I learned about it like the next week in a class. But the reason there aren't carbohydrates in the muscles, that, the animals that we eat, is because when we die, we go through a process called rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is your glycogen stores converting into lactic acid and stiffening the muscle. And then that's why you age meat for it. Ha meat has to be aged for. So if you just killed and ate an animal, there would be a carbohydrate content to it. But when it goes to rigor mortis, the acid actually slightly tenderizes the meat, but it also leaks out and then the body no longer is stiff. But so that's what happens to the carbohydrates in the animal. The glycogen storage it, after death is that rigor mortis process. It converts to lactic acid and then, um, you know, leaves the body. But yeah, so you're you're going into a keto state you, you know you're ketotic because your body is converting all these fats into ketone bodies and you you, you know part of the weight loss is going to be water weight you know 
And you also, if you notice people who do keto as lean as they are, don't have, they have very flat muscles as opposed to like sometimes when you see those bodybuilders and stuff like that, they're very, you know, rounded. Their muscles are well-defined and have a lot of definition to them. And that's because it's the, the glycogen pumps the muscle up. It has water to it and it gives it that curvy bulbous look as opposed to like a very flat, you know, when you don't have a, a lot of glycogen storage or water storage in the muscle, that's where you get that flat look to the muscle. Yeah. And so then moving along, we have um, God's gift to humanity yes. as far as supplements go. The greatest So supplement. a little bit of history, uh, probably what, 500 BC, Jesus came back down to earth and came to Arnold Wait, how could it be how could it be BC? I'm stupid, that's why. Yeah. Um, <laughs> AD? So yeah, 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 yeah. So 500 AD. <laughs> I'm really You're not stupid. Hey, podcast. no negative self-talk on this. Yeah, there we go. No negative self-talk. I'm not stupid. I'm not caffeinated. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's Nick's cutting caffeine out. We're saving caffeine until later because that's uh, you know, there's a the UFC best. event tonight, yeah, so I'll need to be up late. Events. Um, but yeah, we, uh, but, Nick's so, cutting back on caffeine, so forgive him. Yeah. So 500 AD, Jesus came back down to earth to Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was alive then. I know. Yeah. He Arnold was, Schwarzenegger he, is actually great like, for his age. Yeah. He's, he's the top of the Holy Trinity. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know like, that. <laughs> and what he brought down, what Jesus brought down from heaven to God bless Arnold is creatine. Yes. The Holy Grail. Of supplements is yeah. this worth it my question is do you believe like right. the, creatine it, is the fountain of youth creatine is salvation it's Jesus, more important than hydration let's be exactly. honest with ourselves. yeah they really i mean creatine is more important than food if you're if your options are paying your bills buying food for your family or buying creatine get the creatine like <laughs> yeah well so the nice part there is the most researched creatine, like 90 plus percent of the studies is on the cheapest, most prevalent type, which is creatine, creatine monohydrate. Um, there's no reason to buy these designer like HCLs and that kind of stuff. But so creatine, we mentioned it earlier, but so your body has three energy systems, which are your creatine phosphatase system. That's your immediate, that's, you know, like you're looking at 20 or less seconds of intense exercise, sprinting, lifting weights, yada, yada. Then you have your glycogen system, which is going to be your, your glycolytic breakdown of stored carbohydrate. You're not taking carbohydrate into the cell. This would be your carbohydrate that's already in the cell. So your glycogen, and that's about a minute to two minutes of activity, maybe five minutes, depending on your glycogen storage. And then you have your full like Krebs glycolysis pathway, which is bringing sugar or fat in from the bloodstream or from storage from the liver into the cell and then processing that into new energy. That's especially when you look at fat storage, that's unlimited. I mean, you, you can, you could walk for months and never really, I mean, you'll look, you'll burn fat, but you'll never run out. Um, I think we have 200,000 calories. Like the average person has about 200,000 calories of fat. I mean, it's something crazy, but so if you look at how creatine works, so basically what happens is Creatine has a phosphate attached to it. Phosphate, cleaving a phosphate bond. So, so calories, we may have mentioned before, but if not, are a tracking system. It's a measurement system for how energy works. It's basically giving it points. Our body does not use or understand calories. Our body uses energy. And the energy it uses is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So what happens is ATP cleaves a phosphate and it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate, from three phosphates to two, following along. So when that happens, that cleavage of that bond causes energy to be released. So when that happens, you break a phosphate off of ATP and energy gets released. Well, creatine is sitting there with a the phosphate to attach it right back and make that ADP ATP again. 
So if you don't have any creatine in your system, you have about four to six seconds of ATP energy ready for activation of immediate movement. When you add creatine, normal amounts of creatine that are achieved through human processes and regular diet, you can get creatine from red meat and things like that. You up that to about 10 to 12 seconds. When you supplement creatine, you can increase that to about 15 to 20 seconds of all out maximal effort. So creatine does not build muscle for you. It gives you the energy potential to lift more for longer, to sprint harder for longer, to, to up that intensity without having to rest or break down or become tired. What's super interesting about creatine is yes, it is giving you action potential and that kind of stuff, but there's so much, I, I, every single athlete, I had strength coaches try to say that it caused muscle pulls, which is garbage. There's never been studies showing that. I got in arguments. I went behind their backs. I mean, if they're listening, sorry. <laughs> I, every single player was, was told to take creatine, in my opinion, because it's muscle preserving. So if you are just, if you exercise at all, take creatine. If you are aging, take creatine, because it's shown that without resistance training, it can help slow the loss of muscle due to age. And there's research coming out that creatine helps protect the hypoxic environment or the energy crisis that is known as concussions during sport. So having creatine, basically what a concussion is, is it's the inability for the brain to receive oxygen and energy for a, a moment of time because of the way that the impact occurs. With creatine loaded in the, in the brain, it can provide that energy to help minimize the damage, the brain damage from a concussion. So football, a lot of concussions, boxing, fighting, a lot of concussions. If you have creatine there, it can minimize that potential damage. It's so cheap, so accessible, and has so many benefits to like exercise potential, muscle building, et cetera, et cetera. It's, there's no reason not to take it. The only thing with creatine is it causes water storage. However, it's a one-time deal. You start taking creatine, it's going to cause your body to store more water, and then it's going to cap off, and that's just your new normal. It's not like it keeps adding water retention. So once you adjust for that water weight, if you're in a weight-specific sport, it's just a new normal. Start taking it in the off-season and then cut your fat down to reach whatever your body weight goal is. And then that's just your new normal. It's not something to freak out about, but creatine is the number one, don't care who you are, need to be taking it supplement. There's no, I mean, that and vitamin D, everybody should be taking every day, period. And there, the one downside to creatine is that for some people, it does cause like gut discomfort. And if you're one of those people, then I would recommend kind of backing off and then slowly increasing so that yeah. you can build up your tolerance. Or try one of those designer brands. That, I mean, that might be one of those, it, 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 a different chemical salt, you know, creatine salts or creatine chloride or something like that might be better, you know? But I, uh, I just, you know, I, yeah. if, the, if, it, if it does cause gut discomfort, you know, that kind of sucks, play around with it, like Nick said, but it's pretty rare that yeah. that's going to occur. I mean, I, I don't know very many people that have adverse reactions to creatine. Same here, but I'm sure there's a lot of our, our favorite gym bros out there listening to this and they're going, well, if creatine is the supplement that Jesus gave to Arnold, what about pre-workout? Did pre-workout come with it? I mean, those tinglys are not just out of this world. Those tinglys are heavenly. Like, and I, I would say, no, I think, I think pre-workout is probably the gift of the antichrist. Not that pre-workout isn't great and wonderful and gives you performance benefits. It's just not on creatine's level. Um, okay. well, you know, those tinglys come from beta alanine, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, it's a, it's vasodilation. It's subcutaneous mm -hmm. vasodilation is what it's called paresthesis. And the way to combat it is to take smaller amounts of beta alanine. Yeah over time but, um, so pre-workout is so, fantastic go ahead Blair I'll let you I'm go. back and forth on pre-workout I use pre-workout really? don't get me wrong um my main issues are pre-workout is so the main things that work in pre-workout are caffeine 
creatine and beta alanine. Um, a lot of them now have like beta alanine and hydrous, which has some positive research behind it. But then they're like fairy dusted with a bunch of like cat's claw bark and you know him bean mm-hmm. and all kinds of bullshit that don't have solid research and definitely not in the amounts that are added. Um, and here's here's one way to kind of distinguish if it was from Christ or the Antichrist. Does it have research to back it up? Creatine does. A lot of pre workouts. Well, so really. interesting enough. So like my main so a lot of issues with pre-workout it's typically not enough of the of the things so creatine you want five grams per day beta alanine you want three and a half and caffeine in order for an exercise benefit, a muscle contraction benefit you need three to six milligrams per kilogram which for somebody nick nick and my size about 220 pounds is minimum of 300 milligrams You know, so a lot of caffeine or uh, pre-workouts, their caffeine levels are about 200. So I need a scoop and a half. You know, if they're not having those levels, you now have to buy extra creatine and beta alanine in order to get the right amounts on top of what your pre-workout has in it. Also, those two supplements are not acute uh, reacting. Creatine and beta alanine, they work by taking a daily amount. You take the same amount every day, day in and day out, and it builds up in your system and has an effect. So there's no point in putting it in a pre-workout other than because people remember to take pre-workout most days. But if it's not enough and you don't take pre-workout every day, you still need to take creatine and beta alanine every single day. That's how those supplements work. Um, So... To me, it's like build it yourself, you know, drink a coffee, take a caffeine pill, um, you know, buy creatine and beta alanine separate. They're very cheap. Both of those are pretty cheap. Um, But there has been research showing that multi-ingredient pre-workouts do have some added benefit and exercise to just taking caffeine. And I question whether, I, I don't think it's as a result of the creatine and stuff because it takes about three to four weeks for creatine and beta alanine to see a benefit in the system once you start taking them. So it wasn't long enough studies really to have that occur. Maybe it was, I mean, if it was a 12 week study, maybe that made a small difference in the, in the exercise gains and that kind of stuff. But there was like a collaborative effect from pre-workouts, but I just wonder a lot about the studies and that kind of stuff. Um, you do have to be careful with some of the, some of the pre-workouts. So when I was working at a supplement store, we had, I want to say at least three or four pre-workouts that were known to make you fail a drug test. So they oh, pop yeah. for amphetamines. Well, and that, so if in the NFL, it has to be NSF certified. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's another one that's informed choice for sport that I believe like the, the NSF certification thing was not like a hard rule, but I mean, every NFL team adheres to it, but informed choice is a little cheaper, but I've heard just as good, but basically what those do is so supplements are not regulated by the FDA. You can put whatever you want in them and there's, it's just kind of a crap shoot if it has that third party test from NSF or uh, informed choice, then what they are testing is that it has what is on the label in the amounts they said and nothing else, you know, so that's what you're getting by using that third party tested uh, supplement is that if you don't take a drug test and you want to take that risk, sure. But uh, in my opinion, for the most part, like why, why take the risk? If you, if they've tested it and it's saying like, what's on the label is what's in here and nothing else, then great. You know, like that's, that's the way to go in my opinion. So, yeah. And so, um, kind of next, as far as like performance and everything goes, there's the, the whole glycogen replenishing supplements. Um, I personally think just pack a roll. Okay, bring say, some isn't bread that, isn't or that just sugar like yeah like like bring bread or something if you're worried about getting it immediately yeah, after your I, workout Kool-Aid. But, i mean like <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> um so but the thing there too is like what are you replenishing your glycogen for if you just eat normal meals your glycogen is fully replenished within a 12 to 24 hour window and 
unless you're going like pretty hard for hour, hour and a half straight, you're not depleting your glycogen. I, yeah, I mean, it was, like it, it t- 90, 90 minutes to two hours for full glycogen depletion, you know? So it's not like you're Lance Armstrong and you're getting up tomorrow to go bike. Are we still, we're not fans of Lance Armstrong because he blood doped. I don't, I don't know where we're on that or anybody broke up with Cheryl Crow. So race, I don't know, so. whatever. But yeah, so you're not performing, you know, every six to eight hours, you're not doing an Ironman every weekend, you know, for things like that, I think there's benefits to glycogen replenishing protocols, not even just a supplement, but like if you're a triathlete or an Ironman where you have a three day race, you need to be hitting that glycogen window, which is, that's where the 30 minutes comes from is you have 30 minute uh, optimal glycogen uptake following exercise. You know, so if you did your, and like Ultraman, I think is really the one that's all right that's probably where it's most important is if you did your because what's an ultraman it's uh like a three mile swim and an 80 kilometer bike ride and then a let me i'm gonna look it up so i don't i was gonna say i think it, it's probably like an 80 kilometer run because i think a regular iron no it's a- it's uh um 6.2 mile swim, 10 kilometer Jesus swim. Christ. Followed by a 90 mile bike ride. The next day is a 171.4 mile bike ride. And then the third day is a double marathon. Uh, so 84 Christ. kilometer run, um, 52.4 miles. So in that situation, you know, a marathon takes the average person like six to eight hours, right? I mean, like maybe four hours. I think some some of those freaks do it in like two. You know, like what? <laughs> isn't that a world record for a marathon? Two hours, like I'm not just under sure. two hours or something like that. But yeah, so like a double marathon, you're not doing both marathons in four hours if that's where you're at. You know, like it, you're looking at eight or so hours of activity. So there's got to be proper fueling during. But in order, after all this other activity, when you finish your swim and bike ride, you need to be hitting your glycogen re- replenishment to then do the next bike ride and you need to do it again to then do the run, you know? So that's where I think that you get your benefit from glycogen replenishing. But if you're just going to the gym today and then you have a full day and you're going to the gym about the same time tomorrow, like, no, I mean, zero point, absolutely zero point. Just eat food. Yeah. And so now we have the nice magical fat burners and detoxes. So if you're up on like the nutrition, kind of health side of social media everybody's been bashing those for a while but I I still see them getting pushed like um somebody I saw somebody on Instagram selling a fat burning essential oil that made me I still don't really know what essential oils do I it's weird I see people that yeah I've seen people that like study like oh I had tea tree oil and I'm like Mm -hmm. I mean, oils have benefits, but I feel like essential oils are like Himalayan salt, where the amount yeah. you would have to consume, like if you think Himalayan salt is better than regular salt, you're fooling yourself. Because look at the mineral makeup. In order to get like, I think the next highest mineral tends to be like magnesium. I mean, it depends on. And so first off, Himalayan salt does not come from the Himalayas. It comes from like <laughs> Iran. Um, but if you look at the mineral breakdown in order to hit the RDA for the next highest mineral, whatever it is, I think it tends to be like magnesium, potassium, things like that. You would have to eat like eight grams of sodium. Whoa. (laughs) The RDA for sodium is like two to three grams, you know? So you're looking at four, two to like three to four times the recommended amount of sodium to get your RDA for the next Jesus. mineral you know so it's it's bullshit and i think that's kind of where essential oils are it's like there might be benefits but is are you really consuming or putting enough of it on your skin or whatever the hell you do with it diffusing it to really see a huge benefit from the use of that oil um but anyway yeah. we're talking about fat burners yeah uh, and, well fat burners come in all trash. different shapes and see them in the trash throw your money straight in the trash and like yeah. instead of buying them and throwing them away just throw your money right in the garbage that's Dude, they they're more expensive than half of the other supplements on it's our caffeine list. Like, with like fucking green tea and cayenne yeah. pepper added to it is what most of them are 
like but they come in so many different so many different shapes and sizes like i mean like i said you have the the quote unquote fat burning essential oils which is total bullshit there's another one that's like oh you take this this like fat burning balm rub it on your stomach wrap it in this like elastic or whatever and that's supposed to be like a waist trainer slimmer fat burner kind of thing it was it's insane. I mean, so the idea behind a fat burner, so we'll, we'll, we'll mention it a thousand times because consistency is key in diet and exercise and message. Fat is burned by creating a caloric deficit. And the idea behind a fat burner is so caffeine is known for, and I, I know like we haven't specifically talked about caffeine, but we've mentioned it in pre-workouts and things like that. You can take caffeine by itself, but I mean, so caffeine releases fatty acids into the bloodstream. That's one of the benefits of it. Um, However, it requires exercise and movement in order to uptake and burn that caffeine out of the bloodstream. So then green tea has something called EGCG, um, which caffeine also stimulates the neurotransmitter um, catecholamines, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, things like that, which are responsible for your sympathetic nervous system, increasing heart rate, energy utilization, things like that. What EGCG does is it breaks down the, so it, it basically allows those neurotransmitters to exist in the synapse longer. So caffeine releases them, green tea allows them to activate and stay activated longer so it's the synergy there green tea plus caffeine can cause more energy utilization and higher fat burn than doing either one of them independently um then you still have to burn calories and move and make sure that you are burning that fat. It's so uh, I think attached to this is carnitine, which was uh, the carnitine is what moves fat from the bloodstream into the cell to be utilized as energy. And that was a supplement that was real popular in the like early two thousands. But the issue is that carnitine is an on-demand process. Your body makes it to move fat into the cell as needed People would take carnitine thinking, oh, I'm going to move more fat. I'm going to transport more fat. No. The limiting factor there is the need to burn fat. Fat is released. Carnitine takes it into the cell when it needs to be utilized. If your body doesn't need to use fat for energy, it just goes back into a fat cell and stores again. You know, so knowing the physiological effect on how things work is a huge part of understanding whether or not it will work because just releasing fatty acids does not burn them. Just having the transporter to move them into the cell does not do that you have to release it for a reason take it into the cell for a reason and burn it for a reason in order for all of that cascade to occur you know so is there an effect there sure is the effect going to do anything without effort no you know so like just having a fat burner there isn't just magically and so like i mentioned cayenne pepper like yohim bean so those are thermogenic boosters they basically make you sweat or make your body burn at a hotter temperature but if you if the difference between you losing your weight and not is the let's say 40 calories a day that taking a fat burner is going to up by being a thermogenic booster i think you got some other things to loosen up in your diet you know like it's throwing pebbles in the ocean if you're if you're and that, that's the thing with supplements if you look up a nutritional hierarchy it's caloric maintenance micros and macros and then supplements is that little tiny peak. You know, everything else has to be in check. If your hydration's not in check, if your sleep's not in check, if your macros and energy balance are not in check, if your foundational systems are not in check, supplements are going to, you're wasting your money in general, period. Well, and here's the thing with like, with that, uh, that pyramid there is supplements are at the top, the lowest effect for your everyday person. You can just cut that top off. Don't use the supplements at all. Stand up there and be like, look at this pyramid I made. It looks great up here. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up carnitine because this is a perfect example of your supplement guy giving you a problem that you didn't know you had and selling you something that you didn't know you need because you don't need it. Carnitine is a perfect example. So if I was, when I was 
selling supplements, trying to sell somebody a fat burner. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't like stimulants. I don't, I can't have that much caffeine or God forbid they have high blood pressure. Um, so then we would shift them towards carnitine and call it a, uh, a non-stimulant fat burner, which it's not. It's, carnitine is an amino acid. And so, I mean, the whole pitch was like, you know, you, you, you take this, it's going to give you more carnitine, which is going to help you burn fat because it helps shuttle fat. Well, that's a problem you didn't know you had. The problem is, oh, I don't have enough carnitine and then sell you something that you didn't know you needed, which is that carnitine supplement. Here's the thing. You have enough carnitine. You don't need to supplement it. So that's a perfect example of how, how your supplement guy, while he might be a great dude, I know a lot of guys who uh, actually, one of the guys who came and take my, took my place at that company, awesome dude, awesome dude, but he's good at his job. Don't walk into that store and expect that you're not going to be sold on something like don't trust your supplement guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I want to skip, we are going to kind of talk about vitamins, green powders. I, I'll just say like, so vitamins work by preventing deficiencies. That's the one thing about micronutrition that's, that's tough for people. I, I honestly think micronutrition is as important, if not more important than macronutrition, because without everything being in check, your body is not as efficient at utilizing energy at converting energy at all these systems. You know, micronutrition is uh, a lot of times, especially with women who tend to avoid red meat um, and don't get much iron in their diet and lose more iron. Women need more than twice as much iron per month than men uh, per day. I mean, whatever you want to break it down to. But if you, if your hands get cold very easily or extremities get cold very easily, if you just feel like tired and lethargic, that's typically iron deficiency. That's the first thing I'm going to look at, you know, and it's something that you can get through diet if your diet is appropriate. And it's one of those things where like, okay, vitamin D pretty safe to take in, in high quantities. B vitamins, the ones, you know, vitamin C is probably one that a lot of people don't maybe get enough of because if you heat vitamin C, it breaks down very easily. Um, but like you need to get a vitamin panel done to see what your levels are at to decide if you should be supplementing those things. And you need to consult a doctor on some of them like potassium, iron, the ones that are very dangerous to supplement because they become very toxic or they're very reactive. Um, you know, potassium, iron, you won't find more than two to 4% of your daily value in a supplement because they're highly reactive or highly toxic. Um, and so you just, I mean, you just can't take that large of amounts, but when it's contained in food, it's more absorbable and it's easier to get to. Green powders are kind of bogus in my opinion. Like basically just eat the plant instead of turning it into a powder. I mean, that's, that's really where I'm at on it. I don't yeah, really have much to say other than that. <laughs> and that, that's exactly what I was thinking. Like if you're worried about getting your greens, just eat more greens. And here's the thing. A lot of people have a goal of fat loss eating more greens you're getting all the fiber and everything with it that's going to keep you full and so it's kind of hitting to or working towards hitting two birds with one stone right increasing your vegetable intake which can indirectly decrease your calorie intake so green powders no, no yeah no. well and i actually I just remembered something about carnitine that, since we brought it up yeah a lot of times, and it's, it, this is true of a lot of supplements, so taking carnitine wound up doing nothing, not even because it wasn't necessary, but it got broken down in its constituents, which it was some amino acid and vitamin C, more or less. So your stomach and your digestive system can break this stuff down. So if, we mentioned beta alanine a few times. So beta alanine is a uh, muscle buffer. Basically, what beta alanine does is it prevents your body um, from building up acid in anaerobic exercises. So that's gonna be sprinting, lifting, things like that. So you don't get sore as quickly during the exercise. Um, so what winds up happening is, I don't know why there's such a glare on me. Oh, it's because of the window. Um, so what winds up happening is you are able to go a little longer, a little harder on a performance level. But the amino acid, the the, chemical responsible for that buffering is carnosine. I know this gets confusing between carnitine, carnosine, creatine. So 
carnitine bad doesn't do anything i mean it's good in your system it has a purpose as a supplement does nothing creatine awesome amazing take carnosine is this ph buffer however if you take carnosine nothing happens beta alanine turns into carnosine so you take beta alanine to produce carnosine so it's one of those things where like just because you take the thing doesn't mean it becomes the thing your body has filtration systems and processes and things like that that are necessary to make this stuff occur um which leads us into our next one which is pro hormones yes and pro hormones honestly do not fucking take them no don't, don't take anything that even well, advertises and they don't have an effect yeah well so interestingly enough um i didn't know about not having an effect the we did sell pro hormones where i used okay, to i'm work. assuming so pro hormones are basically you have your hormones and then there's a pro hormone and a pre pro hormone the way the body works is they get transported through the system attached to different proteins and in different forms so they're not running around the system activated and then mm -hmm. they react with something and become an active form when they need to bind a receptor at the site yada 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 so basically and this is a very loose description the pro hormone will come to the it, so it, it let's I, i'm assuming you're talking mostly about testosterone in this sense yeah, yeah. which so is the most we, common one so sold, or, the pro yeah. hormone is androstene dione or androstene diol what's going to happen is if you just had free active testosterone floating around it would just bind to the receptor wherever it hits and do things but it needs to be doing something at a certain place. So that cell will have the enzymes or the activation chemical needed to convert it into its active form so that it can bind the receptor where it needs to work. So that's wh what a pro hormone is. It's like a transport or movement version of the hormone itself. Mm -hmm. And so what we sold when, when I was, working for that company is, I mean, we sold test boosters, we sold estrogen blockers, which most of them were known to be tainted with steroids. And we actually advertised them as the closest thing we can get or the closest we can get to actually selling steroids. These are not things you want to fuck with, especially when you start messing, when you start messing with your hormones, your endocrine system, it's not pretty. So you're taking something that increases your test testosterone. I almost said testosterone. <laughs> um, nice. But you're taking something that increases your testosterone and your body's going to reduce or completely shut off its own testosterone production. This is why when uh, like elite bodybuilders, they take steroids and their balls shrivel up because your testicles produce testosterone and it has no need for it anymore because they're taking such a tremendous amount of steroids, which is giving them their own testosterone. Right. And so you're, if, you're, if your gland does not have a reason to make it because you're taking it from an outside source, it atrophies, yeah. it dies. So um, when it comes to even like if you're taking an estrogen blocker, right? You're a male taking an estrogen blocker, your body's going to upregulate its estrogen production. And then so when you come off of that, you are wholly fucked up. And it is, it is not worth taking these pro hormones. And then even in our, our list, we have SARMs, which are uh, selective androgen receptor modulators. Those are things, those are illegal to sell for human consumption. The FDA. And they're a crap shoot. Yeah. It yeah. is. You do not know what's going to happen by taking those. It's, they're so all over the place. Um, so androgens, just, so this is why I get so fed up when you hear people, I didn't take a endocrinology class until my master's i took exercise endocrinology by the way my favorite class i've ever taken uh it was organic chemistry and then it became exercise endo and it helped my teacher dr orangey was amazing uh he's he's a great dude and he's he's very intelligent but the reason i loved it so much is because hormones are conceptual and logical and the way that he did his tests were like you had to explain that you knew the effect and the feedback loops of hormones. So 
basically, like we mentioned with the atrophying of the gland, that's called a feedback loop. Your body and, and each hormone is going to be different. Like with he, he, just mentioning the estrogen blockers and with like type two diabetes, this is how this kind of stuff works is your body releases it to bind to a receptor. If it binds that receptor and doesn't have an effect and the thing that it's trying to change does not change, it's going to produce more. So estrogen is needed for a reason. You block estrogen and the body's going to produce more and produce more and produce more because it's going to upregulate because it's not receiving the results that it's supposed to by releasing estrogen. Well, type 2 diabetes, the point of insulin is to get blood or sugar out of the blood into the cell, but there's a problem in that cascade of bringing the GLUT4 receptor to the cell surface and taking in, uh, in uh, glucose. So what the body thinks is, and I've heard a lot of different theories. We're still not quite sure. It could just be a lack of um, communication in that hormonal cascade. I've read that it's actually, in some cases, an overproduction of glucagon, which is the opposite of insulin. It's what tells blood uh, sugar to uh, stop going to the cell and maybe release from the liver into the blood. Um, so I've heard that it's, it's an excess of glucagon combating the effect of insulin. I mean, there's a lot of theories, but basically insulin gets released, it binds, nothing happens, the blood sugar stays high, more insulin gets produced. And what winds up happening is the liver or the pancreas overproduces insulin and you, get, you can get pancreatic cancer because it's overproducing and overproducing and shuts down and starts to die because it's working so hard its whole life with no effect, you know, so, and that's one of the easier to understand. So then you have, so androgens are your sex hormones. That's your testosterone, your estrogen, your things like that. The feedback on this kind of stuff, how it affects, how it binds the pro pre hormones, that kind of stuff. All of this is a very like intricate, delicate system. And they, they have hormones that release releasing hormones. You know, so like it's, there's stimulating hormones, there's releasing hormones, there's, I mean, it, it's crazy how intricate this system is. And it's so intricate and ridiculous that I don't remember everything I learned in exercise <laughs> endo, you know, and it was my favorite class, you know, so just saying shit like, oh, your hormones are out of whack. It's like, the fuck does that mean? You know, <laughs> so, and then Clip. what SARMs are doing is it's trying to select certain androgen receptors. So the receptor would be like a lock and key. There's a receptor on the cell and there's only a certain hormone that fits and binds to that receptor to cause a down signaling of cascade, which is your P, PP and DAG, I believe is that what they are. PIP, PIP and DAG are your different, like there's, there's all these different hormonal signalings that occur to get it into the cell and cause an effect. And so it's specific hormone, specific receptor. And there's some that like cross over, IGF-1, insulin, and certain things like that, all somewhat similar, you know, but whatever. It is so intricate and delicate and convoluted to understand all this. And you have people taking SARMs, which are, like I said, are a crapshoot. You have people saying shit like, oh, it's your hormones are probably, what fucking hormones are out of whack? You know, your leptin, your ghrelin, your insulin, your what, you know, like people are just like, oh, insulin's the problem. Insulin's not a fucking problem. It, I'm sure most diabetics type one or two are getting very aggravated at people saying like, oh, we got to keep our insulin levels low. What? No, we need to keep our blood sugar low. Especially your, your type one diabetics. Who yeah. You know I mean? It's, it's astounding to me. Insulin. The dumb shit that comes out of people's mouths. Just, like it's like <laughs> hormones is it's as easy to say as calories in versus calories out. Yes, correct. Hormones have a play. Calories in, calories out has a play. How the fuck do you get there? How do you do anything about it? How do you change it? How do you manipulate it? How do you do any, I mean, like saying hormones means fucking nothing. It means nothing to me. Like it's, I get so hot with that shit and be like, oh, your hormones are probably out of balance. It's like most people's are. What do you do to change it? How, you don't, I mean, don't say biohacking to me either, because that's a load of oh shit. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so don't take SARMs. I mean, there's a million of them, and they're, you have no idea what effects it's going to have in your body. Don't take pro-hormones, because they don't have an effect. Basically, androstene diol and androstene diol don't convert into testosterone and cause any physiological changes. They could have negative feedback loop effects, but they, they're not going to have any benefit. 
And if they do have an effect with what you're looking for, if they're boosting your testosterone, if it's blocking your estrogen production, run as far away from there as you can. Yeah. That's the, that, those pro hormones are specifically the main reason why I quit my job. Um, Cause I couldn't, I couldn't handle them. We talked about performance a little bit with some of these. Um, and so just to kind of recap, you know, with performance and supplements, the, the same ones that I told everyone that they should be taking are the ones that I promoted to my uh, NFL players, creatine, you know, if you like caffeine, great. If you have issues with, if you want to be vegan and you have issues, mo- I mean, I, I don't think I had a single vegan, pure vegan. I had people that liked plant-based because they had milk issues, but I don't think I had any vegans in my time with any actually excess or the dolphins. Um, you know, but I used a lot of whey protein. I encouraged from a CTE protocol standpoint, everybody be taking curcumin and fish oils because there's some research showing that those can help minimize the damage and rebuild certain brain pathways. I think specifically BDNF, which is brain derived neurotropic factor, uh, decreases as we age, gets, dec- gets damaged and decreased with concussive damages. Um, but though that it shows some regenerative properties with those supplements, the anti-inflammatory aspects and that kind of stuff, but you know, creatine, beta alanine, but the thing is, and a lot of guys aren't going to take supplements. Uh, they just don't want to. I mean, I, we had a lot of stuff there. Vitamin D I encourage because it helps with muscle building. It helps with recovery. It helps with a lot of stuff, uh, you know? Um, and then we did, I always did a um, beet root powder, beet elite for a pre-workout. I mixed it with BCAAs for the uh, pre-workout reduction. Actually, I started using EAAs, but still for a reduction in fatigue and for taste. I mean, that's another thing is like, it's got to taste good to some of these guys, but you know, if it tastes like fruit punch instead of beetroot, they're going to be a little more into it. Uh, beetroot powder is a vasodilator, increases the size of the blood vessel, um, dilation of the blood vessels so that oxygen can, can move more readily. And then everything else was uh, as needed. Um, you know, we had probiotics. I, the only reason I liked our probiotics is I don't remember what strain it was, but I did research and there's one strain in there that showed a reduction in accumulative fatigue. But the thing with all this, with, with elite level supplementation is when you're talking about the difference between in the hundred meter run and and gold medal Olympic and not placing is a 10th of a second. When you expand that to the 10,000 meter, it's like 1.1 seconds. You know, so the slightest edge can cause a huge difference. And even at that level, there are guys who are not doing everything they can nutritionally. You know, they are not taking care or taking advantage of all the recovery tools. You know, so supplements are still the top of the pyramid there where it's, okay, yes, I can offer you these things and you can feel a benefit and you can like them. But- if you're not doing A, B, C, and D, does E really matter? You know, because you're not getting there yet. You know, so like, yes, there can be very minute differences. And, and it, I think it turns all the way back down to Gatorade. The number of people that make fun of Gatorade. So I, I'd say the number one supplement that I pushed aside from creatine was drip drop, hydration. And so drip drops an ORS, oral rehydration solution. And... I hydration is the name of the game, a, a 2% reduction in body weight due to dehydration, which is not a lot, especially at that level. I had a tight end lose 16 pounds in one practice Holy from water shit. loss. Yeah. One practice went down 16 Whoa. pounds. So a 2% reduction in body weight, which for most of these guys would be four to six pounds is a 30% reduction in output and efficiency and, and energy utilization, things like that. So hydration was a big part of it you know so like getting that that classic baseline stuff your your foundational stuff in order is still the number one name of the game and then we'll look at your supplementation and we'll start adding you know little things like that where it's you know yes there are certain things that could probably cause a benefit that could they could give a little elevation that could do that little extra you know, love beetroot powder. I love having all the proteins. I love having, you know, access to these fish oils and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, we got to make sure everything else is in check 
before we go ham on all this other stuff because if those things are not there then you're losing a lot more you know if if the difference between gold medal is 9.5 seconds to 9.4 seconds that's a lot less than 30 percent and just hydration is enough to make that you know consequential difference you know so yeah there's certain supplement but it's it's one of those things where like it's still the same story make sure the foundational stuff's in place and then let's take a look at supplementation to try to achieve these you know major differences i like that i do so that brings us to our our trend and or fad or just whatever is going on that has some relevance. Even if it doesn't I have relevance. I hate Herbalife. So the first one was Herbalife <laughs> and liver failure. I didn't hear anything about this. I saw you posted about it, but mm-hmm. I so, am going to defer to you because I don't. I didn't read about it. Yeah. So um, I saw a, an interview where it was an interview of a doctor. I don't know if it was a PhD or an MD, but anyway in India who had written a research paper in that got published in the journal of clinical and experimental hepatology, which hepatology is just the study of the liver. So what they found is they, there was somebody who actually died and they had documented proof through their research that they died from acute liver failure because they were taking Herbalife, which Herbalife it's, it's MLM. Yeah. It's a mo- it's yeah. it's a pyramid scheme for selling nutrition supplements. Yeah. And yeah. So um anyway, where where this is relevant to supplements is Herbalife is a huge huge MLM supplement company. The journal that it was published in was peer reviewed. So you have other professionals in the field reviewed the evidence, they said this is good and it got published. So Herbalife contacted them and said, "Hey, you know, you're talking shit about my product. I want, you know, I want your evidence. I want to see your evidence. I want you to make a case for yourself. And they said, you know, all our evidence is in the paper. You know, here's the paper. Boom. They sent it to them. Didn't hear anything for a while. Then they got another letter from another researcher who worked for a company that I believe is owned by Herbalife. It's either owned or funded by Herbalife. Mm-hmm. And it was a rebuttal to their, their study. And so this, this doctor and the, the co-authors of the study got together and came up with a rebuttal to their rebuttal, sent it back, boom, you know, didn't hear anything from them. Well, they got another letter from another company that is either owned or funded by Herbalife with another rebuttal. And again, they, they came back and their evidence was sound. This was in a peer reviewed journal. Yeah. Their evidence was sound. But what they didn't know was Herbalife was sending legal notices to everybody around them, the editors of the journal, like everybody who published this article was getting a legal notice from Herbalife to the point where actually they all, the paper got officially retracted. And so, I mean, it's just insane. I, I sent this uh, post with a link to the, the interview to Blair and cause he had to deal with something similar to this with like glycogen replenishing supplements. Um, his school was getting sued for defamation because they did, a, they did some research and their claims were false. But anyway, uh, my point was that Herbalife had clearly has a much higher legal budget than the company that was suing uh, Blair's, the school that he was researching for. This that was supplement was UCAN. And UCAN. it was, it was yeah, they're a, a slow release mm-hmm. carbohydrate. Uh, it, Waxy Maze, I think was the original, yeah. you know, but so they, uh, they claim that it increased beta oxidation or fat burn because of the slow processing of the carbohydrate. And we, our study showed that it didn't increase beta oxidation whatsoever and actually caused a lot of gastrointestinal distress. And they sent us a subpoena uh, and a court order because they wanted to sue us because they didn't like the results. Yeah. So uh, apply that to what was happening here uh, over there in India was everybody around the authors of this study were getting these subpoenas. They were getting all these legal letters threatening lawsuits. And so without telling them, the editor of that, that, that magazine, Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hepatology, actually retracted the paper didn't tell them. Uh, when they asked about it, they were told it was for quote unquote legal reasons. 
and then eventually at some point it that official reason got changed to i mean this is really just to tell you how much one how dangerous supplements can be first off second off had i mean the reach of something like herbalife so i still i have the links up if you we'll go put to, it in the show notes yeah, yeah it'll yeah. be in the the description in the show notes and everything the link to pubmed actually says uh for legal reasons, the publisher has withdrawn this article from public view. Okay. And if you actually go to the full text, it takes you to one page that kind of lists the authors and everything. And um, <clears throat> it says at uh, the last little paragraph says the INASL, which is the Indian National Association for the Study of the Liver and the JCEH, which is the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hepatology, says they no longer support the content of and conclusions drawn in the article because the scientific methodology, analysis, and interpretation of the data underlying the article were insufficient for the conclusions drawn, and with its removal, the article can no longer be relied on. So my whole point for bringing this up is that it's don't don't trust these fucking supplements dude don't right like i that's crazy to me that like yeah it's a problem with science too Mm -hmm. is that yeah you you have this sound article that's like looking out for people's health because somebody died Mm -hmm. and died and they proved they're like yeah we proved it's because of this one supplement and they're like well we make a lot of money but the thing is have you ever met a nutritionist a dietitian who sells herbalife they're always like pseudo nutritionists or nutraceutical sales. And their people will say like Herbalife nutritionist because that's what they do is they don't actually fucking know anything. They just sell this supplement. And it's actually crazy to me because I was looking around for sports nutrition jobs just to see what's out there. The LA galaxy's nutrition program, the soccer team in LA is Herbalife nutrition, sports performance, a fucking like professional soccer team uses Herbalife as their nutrition sports performance overarching body. I refuse to apply. Well, I don't want to live in LA anywhere because LA's trash, but I, uh, yeah, I, I just found that great. But yeah. So like anything that if somebody's proponent and, and so I don't think that's necessarily true. Like, you know, if the whole basis of it is the sale of products, there's a problem. You know, I think like Ben Greenfield, as radical as he is, yes, he sells, he sells some, I think his products are fine. I think they're tested. I think they, he has some good products. He's a little out there, but a uh, Kion, I think it's Keon. Keon, yeah. You know, his, they're good quality, but, and he does sell it, but it's not like in order to follow Ben Greenfield, you have to take Keon. You know, people can sell supplements on it. On it sells supplements. That's what they do. But they also have like training grounds and things like that. Some of their stuff's a little out there, but it's not like in order to follow on its training protocol, you have to buy into on its supplements. Herbalife only exists as selling the supplement. There is no like, oh, I got certified as a nutritionist through Herbalife and I sell their supplements. No, you have to buy their shit in order to follow. You know, it, it, that's a problem. You know, that you're not actually learning anything. You're just taking a fucking shake twice a day and that's your nutrition protocol. And then people are calling themselves nutritionists and sports performance nutritionists. And all it is, is pr- pushing a product. It's a, I mean, and, and look at the reach they have and the money they have to do this kind of shit. It's like something retracted from a peer reviewed journal. Right. Like what? Yeah. I mean, right. but yeah, you can't trust it. Don't trust big MLMs like this. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. And that's the thing is MLMs and, Fad diets are the same thing to me. They're promising lofty results with little effort. And that if something sounds too good to be true, it is. Yeah. Um, I like the second one that you just deleted. Oh, I want that on man. there. Okay. I, In live I, time, I, I did just delete it. I was like, this is a good spot to end the episode and not be controversial. Let's no, click, I delete. want that back. Yeah. Okay. Put it yeah. back. Yeah. There we go. Um so, uh, so we're recording Nick, this. Nick put a Nick put a thing on Instagram. I thought it was hilarious where some dietitian said that 
RDs need to stop promoting Mediterranean as the healthiest diet, which if she left it at that, I have no problem with that. I don't think Mediterranean is specifically the healthiest diet. I think it's the healthiest style of eating. I think the way that they focus on food and family and quality and things like that is beautiful. I, abs I absolutely think that their culture around food is among the healthiest on the planet. I think Asians are the same way. There's a very big focus on food and family with Asian cultures. So no problem with it. We should stop promoting the Mediterranean diet protocol as the healthiest. However, she says that we should stop promoting the Mediterranean diet as the healthiest because it supports white supremacy. That was the craziest thing. Like, I, God bless Reddit for blowing that tweet up so that I yeah. could find it. Idiots oh. need to be put on a pedestal so you can point like, at them and tell them they're idiots. Yeah. So first off, if you think Mediterranean just means Greek and Italian, you got another thing coming. Yeah. Second, right. if you think Greeks and Italians are just white people, you have another you thing. You got coming. another thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it was it was crazy. And so in the the story post on Instagram that I made, I, I listed just some of the Mediterranean countries. Egypt. Libya, like I mean, Morocco, very, Spain, Morocco, <laughs> Spain, France, like just what in the world? And so this really goes in with what we were saying. Not all RDs are good at their job. Some of them are apparently fucking morons. Yeah, like and yes. I, I'm sure I've said plenty of things. Which have you had Moroccan fucking, food? I have. Oh, it's fucking it's, delicious. Yeah. I love Moroccan food. It's there, there's a spice called Raz Al Hanou. So Harissa is predominantly Moroccan. Very interesting thing about Mediterranean food in general. The basis of all of it is pretty similar. Salt, pepper, garlic. All of it's going to have that. But when you look at the separation, most of the African Saharan Mediterranean countries, very spice heavy. Spice does well in that environment. So you're going to have a lot of like cayenne and paprika and cinnamon and things like that that will grow in that environment. When you look at the Northern Mediterranean, uh, Italy, Greece, all that kind of stuff, you have a lot of herbs because those grow better in that environment. So there's a lot of um, basil, oregano, things like that. And then there's trade, you know, so you would trade across the Mediterranean Sea. So you'd have some, but since trade is expensive and the movement of, you know, product across the Mediterranean costs money, the main fare of this Mediterranean African countries is going to have predominantly spices with some herbs, especially on like the more high class or like ritzy dishes. And then the opposite is true in the Northern Mediterranean, you know, but it's just like to think that like, and honestly, it's funny because if she just said that we need to stop promoting veganism as the healthiest diet around because it supports white supremacy, I would agree. I wouldn't have a problem with that because I think veganism is a rich white lady's diet. It's, it is offensive to say that everybody should be plant-based and vegan when there are places in the U.S., the continental U.S., that don't have access to fruits and vegetables. To, to say that everybody should just be eating plates full of vegetables when most a lot of people can't afford – rent every month without taking a payday loan, let alone to go buy out organic whole food produce. You know, so like, do I think that the country, the world would be better on a 90, 80 to 90% plant-based diet with some omnivorous tendencies? Absolutely. It'd be more sustainable, but that's not how it works. That's not how the separation of, of poverty and culture works. You know, like most African countries, if not all, consume meat because it's something that you can especially so the the best source of calorie per cost per land unit is pork pig you you you're gonna go tell some poor farmer in some country that's i mean third world for lack of a better term that they you know you should be plant-based no i'm gonna eat what the fuck i can afford yeah. You know, like that, I, I actually would not have a problem with stopping the promotion of veganism as the healthiest diet because I do think it supports a white supremacist mentality. But Mediterranean, they're not even white. Well, I think we the got most our, of them, you know, what I mean, yeah. And I think we got our next episode and title. We can go into the Mediterranean diet, and the nice little catchy title is 
we're not white supremacists and here's why like yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what i can come up with oh um, right. yeah we'll, we'll we'll brainstorm on that one i think it's funny yeah, yeah so but um, i mean shoot it, that's i i could forgive her too for not knowing her geography cool whatever you only have experience with the european mediterranean countries or in their food like i can forgive that the fact that you tagged white supremacy on it because you don't know your geography like you can't walk back from that you can right. say hey you know what i i didn't consult a map before i made that tweet like i don't know my geography that's why i don't teach it but you can't say look i don't know geography and I'm an asshole who just wants to be on trend and call everything white supremacist. Uh, I'm sorry. You can't, you can't backtrack from that. Yeah. I like, agree. Uh, and I'm for calling out white supremacy where it's actually there, but it takes effort. You have to look into it. Look at a fucking map before you make that tweet. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is sounding, but you know, and I think that's part of the thing is, I've said it before and, and this will be my sign off, but I think that anything like that, uh, false claims, idiotic statements, racism, you know, even to the tune of like failure to promote mental health as, as a positive thing, like taking care of your mental health, things that are not sound behaviors or fair behaviors or promote health need to be pointed at and called out. You know, if you stand there and just let racism occur, you're not, I'm not going to say you're as bad as that person, but you're definitely not a good person. You know, if you let idiots promote idiotic and spread idiotic information, then that's part of the problem. You know, if someone is spouting racist shit, you need to make them feel like shit because that's not okay. If somebody is saying stupid things that are counterintuitive to science and health, you need to make sure that information is called out as being stupid. You, you know, if a kid touches a hot surface and doesn't get burnt, he doesn't learn not to touch hot surfaces. If somebody does something stupid and doesn't be made to feel stupid, they don't learn to stop doing stupid shit. You know, so you need, just like hormones, that feedback of making sure that this doesn't keep occurring. Otherwise, it does. You know, if, if a racist doesn't be made to feel like he's a piece of shit for being racist, then he's going to continue to be racist because he thinks it's acceptable. You know, so that's, we need that feedback group from a societal standpoint to make sure that it stops, you know, and it's not going to stop today or tomorrow. You know, we're not going to go from, you know, feminism's not going to go from, you know, women staying at home and, and cooking and cleaning and taking care of the kids to, you know, having an equal footing in every job front because we want it to, but doing the right thing make sure that it goes in the right direction. You know, like people are still alive that, you know, that people are still running companies that were alive when women didn't have the right to vote, you know? So like, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, but we also have to do our part to make sure that we're calling out sexism, that we're calling out aggressive, toxic behaviors, that we're calling out racism and things like that. So like, it's, that's, that's our onus. Our job is to, make idiots and assholes feel like idiots and assholes there you go and call out your supplement guy because you don't trust them he's an idiot and an asshole yeah <laughs> <laughs> so but thank you guys for listening as you know please subscribe give us that beautiful five star rating like us comment on face on facebook on youtube and yeah. uh, share, share with it. anybody yeah i mean Absolutely. yeah i mean we we uh we do this for fun but we would love you know, just to spread our passion and, yeah. and the information that we do have. Absolutely. Um, so we'll link everything in the show notes. I actually, if you are involved in the health field, um, I have started a discord server for trying to keep com uh, communication going to, for meaningful change. I feel like a lot of times things are brought up and then nothing's done about it uh, as far as educating children, um, putting a stop to misinformation, uh, putting a stop to Instagram influencers, you know, taking over with sensationalism, st stupid shit. Like uh, somebody the other day on Facebook said, uh, if you're depressed, cut out gluten, that kind of stuff. You know, we need to be able to combat that with real truth. We need to make the truth sexy. 
so that's what the point of the Discord server is, is to collaborate and try to actually do something instead of just talking about what needs to be done, but putting effort into it and keeping that communication moving. So if you're interested, send us a comment or message us, uh, Instagram, email, whatever it is, those will all be in the show notes, but I'm Blair Solberger. I own the human element nutrition. You can contact me through Instagram at the human element nutrition or, uh, my email, which is human element nutrition.com at gmail.com. Sorry. Yep. And I'm Nick Schick. You can find me on Instagram at high on H I O N underscore health. You can find me on Twitter at the same handle, just without that underscore. And if my particular lack of caffeine this episode was something that bothered you, there is a supporter link if you'd like to buy me a cup of coffee. So nice. it'll be in the description. Yeah. But thank you for listening, guys. <laughs>